good afternoon or morning um, to everyone, depending upon what part of the world you are. My name is Kathy Lean, and I am managing partner of BK Forex Advisors. Um, if there's any issues with hearing my voice or my charts, please let me know, and I will try to um, adjust them along the way the best I can. So today is Memorial Day Monday, and the weather here in New York is beautiful. So I'm hoping, you know, those of you that are Americans will um, take some time to enjoy your day. Um, it has actually been, you know, a pretty interesting um, morning or overnight in the um, currency markets. We're seeing a little bit more volatility than we would normally see um, on a Memorial Day Monday, particularly um, overnight in the Australian and New Zealand dollars, which are up quite a bit. The euro is obviously still under pressure. We'll touch on that a little bit um, because this is more of a strategy session when we go into, um, you know, kind of what we would look at from a fundamental basis in the market. Now, before I begin, this um, is a disclaimer that tells you that, you know, trading currencies is risky. You know, currencies um, and forex are obviously leveraged instruments, so they magnify your losses as well as your profits. So it's pretty important to be aware of the risks that you have in the markets and to kind of understand um, what you're doing and what, why you're the rationale behind most of your trading. So to begin, um, I'd like to talk about how, you know, there's really only two types of markets out there. And, um, you know, most of us spend a lot of time creating trading strategies and finding um, different ways to analyze the markets. But... At the end of the day, um, all of our strategies kind of, you know, funnel into one of two pockets, and that's either trend or range. And I'm going to flip over to a um, live chart right now just to show you um, this dynamic on, in the markets. And I'll be doing that um, regularly during this session, moving between, you know, um, prepared charts as well as live charts. So what you're looking at right now is um, – a daily chart, um, you know, a live daily chart of the euro dollar. And as you can see here, um, pretty much since the beginning of the month, we've had a very strong downtrend in the euro dollar. And this trend was, you know, I would say about 800 pips with virtually no retracement. Before that, however, we had about four to five months, four months of range trading. So this is the type of behavior that we tend to get in the market, which is on the left-hand side of this chart is a very strong downtrend with very little retracement, then a period of consolidation followed by another trend. So as you can see by these moves here on the left-hand side of this chart, which is from November to the end of 2012, that it was basically a move from 142 down to 126. Yes, there were little recoveries along the way that you perhaps could have picked the bottom here, or bottom here, or bottom here, but you would probably save a lot of gray hairs and um, a lot of frustration and potentially losses if you just looked for opportunities to join this trend rather than fade it. But then what happens when we enter into modes like this? And it does, these bottoms do turn into a more consolidative mode. How can we tell that that's happening, and um, how can we tell that that's the environment that we're going to be in versus the environment like the left-hand side of this chart or the right-hand side of this chart? So that's really the key to trading, um, which is trying to figure out whether we're in um, trend or range mode, because that will allow you to be able to implement your trading strategy. And I think this is a pretty important concept to understand from both a short-term as well as a long-term trading perspective, because even if you're, trading, you're not trading daily charts, like I just showed you the, um, the charts were daily charts, even if you're, just, you're trading, you know, intraday charts, like five-minute charts or 15-minute or charts or one-hour charts, it's pretty important to be aware of the overall dynamic in the market to let you know whether, you know, it's worthwhile to fade a move or it's worthwhile to join the move. So how do we determine whether the market is in trend or range? There's plenty of different ways to do so. Um, the first question to ask yourself is what do you like better? What do you prefer? Now, the reason most of us um, come into this market and we try to buy low, sell high, buy low, sell high is because we're coming into this market from the, from the mindset of equities. 
So in equities, we're taught to buy low, sell high, buy low, sell high, because you know equities have P/E ratios, they have you know value points, things like that. But currencies do not. Um, there's no P/E ratio for a currency, for example. So that is why um, you know I always encourage people to to look for opportunities to join a trend rather than fade it. But you know I will show you ways to join a trend to to pick tops and bottoms that I find a little bit more effective. With um, this in mind, you know, it's important to realize that currencies are trending instruments because we're dealing with countries. I mean, just to look at that chart that we just saw, over the past month, the euro dollar, I believe, only had three days out of, you know, today's 28th day. Out of 28 days, we only had three days of rallies. That's, you know, a pretty small amount. So, yes, you could have try to look for ways to um, pick a bottom in this sell-off. But you may have thought that from the move um, from 135, that 130 would have been a good value point. You know, it's a nice psychological level, nice round number. Maybe you should have bought uh, that, but it just kept on falling and then went down to 128. Maybe you thought the previous low, year-to-date low, 126.25, would have been a good point to buy. But no. Once again, it continued to fall. So that is why I think it's very dangerous to stick your hand out and say, wow, the euro looks cheap, I should buy it now. It's much better to have something to help you identify a um, top or bottom in a currency. So this just shows you a longer term chart of the euro dollar. Let me just show you this on live charts um, as well. That was actually a weekly chart of the euro dollar. Give me one second while my weekly chart loads, and then I'll refresh your screen in just a second. Okay, so this just proves to you how strong these trends are. I mean, look at this, you know, huge move in the euro dollar um, in 2011, also huge move in 2010. I mean, this whole V-shaped move shows you that the trend really is your friend when it comes to currency. So with this in mind, the question then becomes, how can I determine whether a currency is in a trend or range? Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, this is all in hindsight. But, you know, now I'm showing you why, um, how you could determine this, you know, looking forward. But even though it's in hindsight, I don't think it's in hindsight at all to say that currency, because that's really what they are. They um, are extremely trending instruments, and there's a much greater chance that we'll remain in the trend than, um, than we'll actually see a top or bottom. And we need something to help us determine whether they're a top or bottom. Moving right along. All right, so how can we determine trends versus range? Well, this session is called Battle Tested Foreign Exchange Trading Strategies. And my battle-tested forex trading strategy um, has to do with something that I show often and I use often because I find it extremely, extremely effective. And what that is are um, the double Bollinger Bands. They help me determine trend versus range, and I'll even show you in live charts how they have helped me get into um, quite a bit of um, these big moves recently and also what it's telling me in some of the um, more recent charts and which currencies are actually kind of in turn mode, meaning that it may be, you know, a good opportunity to pick a bottom in some currency pairs, but not all. So I do use the double Bollinger Bands to help me determine trend versus range. They're my number one favorite um, technical indicator. But before I show you how to use the Bollinger Bands and how um, they work, I think it's extremely, extremely important to be aware of what is causing these trends. So I said in my description of this presentation, I talk a little bit about um, how Warren Buffett would approach the currency market. And what is the number one rule that Warren Buffett um, has when it comes to investing? Uh, for those of you um, that you know, are familiar with his style, with his style is, well, it's don't lose money, but what it is is to invest in what you know and what you understand. And so that is what we should take from his, um, his uh, you know, wisdom and bring it into 
um, the currency market, which is we should trade and invest in what we understand. Because there is a very good reason why we're seeing this, these huge trending moves in currencies and in euro particular. Because when it comes to currencies, they are affected by what we call the three M's, macro, micro, monetary policy. Now, macro um, pertains to the big themes in the market. And what these big themes are, are political, um, political conflict, equities and risk appetite, oil and gold. So in this you know, current environment, we are dealing with political conflict. And that political conflict, um, it's both political and economical, I would say, is the European sovereign debt crisis, where all, um, you know, at the mercy of the Greeks and what they decide to do with the euro. And this morning you saw the euro, um, you know, kind of trickle lower, trying to extend its losses. And the reason for that is because, first of all, um, Greece is still, you know, trying to figure out what they want to do in terms of keeping the single currency. And more importantly, we have the market shifting its focus to Spain. And unfortunately, 10-year Spanish bond yields rose to a record high during the European trading session this morning. And on top of that, um, what we had was um, the the CDS spreads of Spain's um, of, of Spain's um, bonds, which basically measure the spread between, you know, um, how Spanish bonds are trading versus German bonds, rose um, to above 450 basis points, which tells people that, um, you know, we're entering into dangerous territory. If Spanish bond yields uh, get to 10, get to 7 percent, then we're really in trouble because that means that um, the European Central Bank and the European Union will have to figure out some way to help them. Last time I looked, Spanish 10-year bond yields were about 6.47%, so we're not too far away from that area. Um, you know, there's been a lot of reports in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, many different papers, talking about how you know, Spanish citizens are moving their money out of the bank. So the greatest fear would be a bank run. And um, over the on Friday we had Baxia, which is a pretty large Spanish bank, report that you know they're going to need some you know support. So all of this uh, is putting us in a one-way downtrend in the euro dollar, and this is both political as well as economical because it's political because um, a lot of the Euro officials don't want to take action until um, Greece or Spain themselves um, you know take additional steps to either do austerity, make their own decisions, or basically shore up their own finances. So everyone's sitting on the sidelines waiting for the politicians to get their act together. And the whole idea is that once the politicians get their act together, the hope is that that's going to lead to um, a bit of stability in the markets. And I actually wrote a bit about this in my um, uh, daily piece, um, talking about how what it would take for this crisis to be over. Um, and also, you know, if Greece were to leave the euro, what are the steps? And that would, you know, most likely happen over a weekend. And there was even people saying that it could happen this weekend, but it was a little too close to the timeline. And I think that they don't have the political will um, to get this done before the election. But, you know, there would be a lot of focus next weekend as well because we have a four-day weekend in Europe during due to the spring bank holiday as well as the Queen's Jubilee. And the reason why they really want to do it the weekend is because they want to leverage on the closed market in order to you know, have all the meetings that they need to have. Because you know, if Greece pulls out of the Eurozone, you know, European finance ministers will all need to convene as per the Maastricht Treaty. They would, um, the EU would need to decide whether or not Greece could stay in the Euro. Um, and the Trioka would need to decide whether they need to withdraw bailout funds. The IMF will probably be called on for assistance because Greece would essentially be defaulting on its loans, so they may need money to run their country, so the IMF will be called on. Greece will be shut out of the capital markets, so central bankers around the world, as a result of a probably um, a pretty big sell-off in the market, would need to convene and figure out whether or not um, they need to um, respond through such things as emergency dollar lending measures. So a lot needs to be accomplished, and if they want to avoid a gap down in the markets when they open, They'll need to have all these meetings quickly um, and around the clock over a weekend. So it's going to get messy, and that's why the euro dollar is under pressure.
So when it comes to macro, until this solution comes, we're going to have a very difficult time rallying in the euro dollar. If the, the ECB can help, they can stem the losses by either expanding their long-term refinancing operation or by, um, you know, cutting interest rates. But that would only be a temporary and not permanent solution um, for the euro dollar because, you know, at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, it is, you know, quite – at the end of the day, it is quite, um, you know, a big situation and, you know, something that we have to pay attention to, you know, closely. So, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, microeconomic data is really what matters the most. And um, when it comes to microeconomic data, we've got uh, plenty of it. And Last week, we had quite a bit of European economic data that um, surprised the downside, namely the PMI numbers, the IFO report. Um, we also had the, we also had, um, you know, kind of the non-farm payrolls report due for release this week. So overall, you know, microeconomic data is pretty important because even though risk aversion is the primary reason why the dollar, the U.S. dollar, is performing so well, we cannot ignore the fact that um, improving U.S. economic data is making the U.S. dollar a shining light or a shining star in an environment where things in Europe are just getting are worsening by the day. So microeconomic data will be what kind of determines the shorter term flows in the euro dollar as well as currencies in general. And it's part of the reason why, um, you know, we've been seeing such significant weakness in the British pound because last week we had a lot of um, deployments in UK data. So that kind of determines where currencies move on an intraday basis. And finally, you know, aside from macro um, development, monetary policy really plays a very big role on how currencies are trading, and it's one of the main reasons why is one of the main reasons why the Australian New Zealand dollar are performing so well today because. Overnight, we had Fitch saying that perhaps Australia does not need to cut interest rates again. Um, the market's pricing in another 125 basis points of easing from the RBA. So, if that if they don't need to be that aggressive, um, and Fitch believes they don't, that could lead to a little bit of a short squeeze in the Aussie dollar, which is probably what we've been seeing in the Australian dollar overnight. So, those are the fundamental drivers of currencies and um, what Warren Buffett would be looking at if he was a currency trader. So let's go back to our technicals and let's get back to our trading strategy. Now, what is the standard way to trade Bollinger Bands? Now, many of you may be familiar with um, the fact that uh, there are two ways to look at Bollinger Bands. Bollinger Bands um, help us measure um, consolidation or expansion in the market. If the Bollinger Bands are really tight, that tells us that we're kind of in a consolidative mode, maybe we'll have a breakout in the currency. If the Bollinger Bands are really wide, that tells us we're in a trending mode. Um, it also um, is basically considered an overbought, oversold signal. So in this chart here, you know, uh, in the traditional way of using Bollinger Bands, the whole idea is that the Bollinger, if the currency pair touches the lower Bollinger Bands, considered oversold. If it touches the upper bowl in Japan, it's considered overbought. And um, what you'll find here is that <clears throat> the um, if you use that, you would have been left with quite a number of losing trades because if you bought every single time it touched the lower bowl in Japan, you know all the red circles would be losing trades, all the blue circles would be winning trades. There would have been winners as well, but um, not before quite a bit of losers. And the same thing on the top side, if you would have bought when the currency pair touched the bowl in Japan. So instead, what I love to use and what I use every single day in my charts are um, what we call the double bowl in Japan. So the double Bollinger Bands is um, the double Bollinger Bands consist of the following. They are basically they are basically um, the 20 period standard um, two standard deviation Bollinger Bands and the 20 period one standard deviation Bollinger Bands. So the 20 period two standard deviation Bollinger Band is kind of the um, default whenever you add Bollinger Bands on your chart. And the 20 period one standard deviation Bollinger Band is what I've added in. 
So I'm actually going to put this on the chart to show you how we look at these on live charts. Okay, so right now you should be looking at my live chart of the euro dollar. And let me actually flip back to the daily chart because that's, um, you know, weekly is a little bit too long. Just give me one second while my chart loads. Okay, so there you go, the chart's loaded. So let's actually get these bull and demand on our charts first. So you can do this on any charting package. This, um, all right, is a GFT charting package. So adding Bollinger Bands, defaults are 20 periods, two standard deviations. I get rid of the middle line. I just change them to one color. Um, and once you do this, usually you know, most of your charting packages will remember it, or you can save it so you don't have to do it every single time. So these are the outer bands. And I'm going to add in the inner bands. So 20 periods, change the two to one. Get rid of the middle line, and then change our lines to black. Same thing with this here. Change our line to black, and um, voila. There you go. There's our Bollinger Band. So the first thing that the Bollinger Bands teach us or tell us is whether we're in trend or range. And the way to interpret this is that if the currency pair is trading within the one two band, then we like to say that it's in a trend. So in the case of the euro dollar right now, you can see that pretty much since um I'm not too sure what the date is, I think it's May seventh. May fourth is when it entered the downtrend because it moved into the one two band and the downside. That's when it moves into a downtrend. And if I turn up my, open up my charts and I see that it's trading the one-two band and downside, like it is right now, then what this tells me is that the euro dollar is in a downtrend, so I'm going to be looking for opportunities to sell on rallies and looking for further losses in the currency pair. And to hone this point in even further, right now I would be bearish for the euro, looking for another break below 125 given how it's trading according to the Bollinger Band. If it's trading between the one, two bands, like in this region over here, let me just uh, refresh this. If it's trading into the one, two bands in this region over here, I'm going to be looking for a range for the currency pair to consolidate. For, and I would be saying that the currency pair is basically in range trading mode. Um, so. The another scenario would be in the uptrend, and the uptrend would be somewhere over here. If the currency pair is trading in the one two band, the upside, I would say that it's in a uptrend, and so I'll be looking for um, opportunities to buy on dips and looking for a stronger rally in the euro dollar if it was in an uptrend. So this is what um, the Bollinger Bands help us to do initially, which is to help us determine whether we're in trend or range. So let me go back to my slides. So your so it helps us number one to determine whether we are in trend or range. And this just shows you more charts that if we're trading the one to band the upside when uptrend, one to band the downside when a downtrend. When I go back to live charts, I'll show you something that's in a really nice uptrend right now. These are more charts showing you uh, where the range trading zone would be, which is between the one, two band, where the downtrend would be, where the uptrend would be. So how can we actually use the Bollinger Bands to trade? Well, the Bollinger Bands can help us pick tops or bottoms. So let's get back to our live chart. Before I show you how to pick tops and bottoms, I'm going to show you that uptrend um, in a second. And it's going to be, you're going to see in dollar CAD, you're going to see in dollar Swiss, um, but I'm just going to show you a chart of dollar CAD. So this shows you that when a currency pair in its very strong uptrend, that um, it will remain pretty comfortably within the one, two band. So I would not be, even though, like, for example, the dollar CAD is selling off a bit today, I wouldn't be picking a top in dollar CAD until we close below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. So that kind of answers the question of how do we pick a top or bottom? Well, we pick a top or bottom by waiting. We wait for the currency pair to close below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. So 
So in this case here, what I want to call your attention to is let's um, move from left um, from right to left. Here we're in a little bit of a downtrend in dollar CAD. So in this case, you would you know remain short, look for losses, wait for the currency pair to close above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band targeting the Bollinger Band um, on the other side. And um, so, once again, just to kind of hone the point in a little closer, what I um, want to say is that if we're in the 1-2 band in a downtrend and we close above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band, that's when you would go long targeting the Bollinger Band on the other side. So, once again, the dollar cat is not turned according to our Bollinger Band um, tactic. Here, you can see it goes into the uptrend, closes below it, takes some time, spikes back, back up into the Bollinger Band, but eventually it touches the Bollinger Band on the other side. And we kind of see the seesaw price action here. If we're in a larger up, this is in a more consolidative mode because the Bollinger Band is kind of tight, and that's how you can range trade the pair. But if we're in a broader trend and we turn, once again, it still touches the Bollinger Band on the other side. In this case, you would see the pairing uptrend. It closes below the first standard deviation Bollinger Band, and then targets the Bollinger Band on the other side. This one, we move into to downtrend. We close above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band, targeting the Bollinger Band on the other side, and then it does it, does it again and again. Uh, something that's happening right now that I would want to call your attention to is the Aussie dollar. You actually also see this in the Kiwi dollar. Um, and what you see right now is that, whoops, Sorry, my screen just flashed. Um, let me move my chart over a little so you can see a little bit more price action. And I'll just refresh my screen just in case for some of you that's not calling up. So right now you're seeing that the Aussie dollar um, on Sunday morning or Sunday eve Sunday basically gapped upwards, moved above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. So it tells us that it's turning. You know, this candle obviously has not closed yet, but you know, if it closes like this. It tells us the Aussie dollar is turning, and then you know perhaps we can get a stronger rally to touch the Bollinger Band um, on the other side, or at least uh, to get close to it. Because you can see in this downtrend here, there were some little perks upwards, which didn't quite get there, but they were at least a hundred pip move upwards. So but that's something that we could expect that if we do close above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band, that we could get to parity before we turn lower again. Um, Sometimes we get a really nice turn like this move over here or this move down here, but sometimes we get these little smaller ones. So how do you set the stop loss when it's out of the first air deviation Bollinger Band? Very good question. The best stop loss is a swing low, swing high. Um, so in this case over here, if that is too far away, which sometimes it will be, like in this left-hand side of the chart, the um, stop loss is too far away, then I would say somewhere back into the Bollinger Band um, in the middle area would be sufficient. Um, so once again, it would have to close because we got, you know, Aussie dollar is fading a bit, so it's not clear whether it's going to close here or not. And you see a very similar situation in the Kiwi dollar. Kiwi dollar, uh, just give me one second while my chart loads. Also turning, but we got a little doji happening. You know, overnight it looks much better than it is looking right now because it was, you know, at one point at the top of that candle. But right now, it's fading. Um, now, on a shorter-term basis, there's actually another way to pick tops and bottoms that I actually like to use quite a bit. And um, it uses 15-minute charts for those of you um, that like shorter-term trading. And it still leverages on the Bollinger Bands. Um, and it's something I like to call the extreme fade. So let's move over to 15-minute charts, and I'll show you how this would work. Okay, so the, because we're in 15-minute charts, we use slightly more significant Bollinger Bands because the because the law the shorter term you go, the um, the less significant the deviations are. So on the daily and weekly charts, we use the 20 period two standard deviation Bollinger Band and the 20 period one standard deviation Bollinger Band. So on the 15-minute charts, what we use is we use the 20-period, 2-standard deviation, and the 20-period, 3-standard devi deviation. So if you bear with me one second, I am going to 
change this to the third standard deviation Bollinger Band. And what we're going to, going to add on here is another technical indicator, which is the ADX, which measures the strength of trend. Make it a little darker. And then I'm going to add just a little horizontal line in here, just for reference purposes. Okay, so right now, it's a very similar concept as what we had been looking for at a minute ago, but it uses slightly expanded Bollinger Band. So, what we're looking for is we're looking for a very extreme move before we pick a top or bottom. So, in this case here, we're looking for the currency pair to rally close at or above the third standard deviation Bollinger Band. But we don't just take the trade just because it does that. What we do is we wait, and we wait for the currency pair to close fast below the second standard deviation Bollinger Band. At that point, we'll check the ADX, and we only take the trade if ADX is, um, is confirming our trade. So basically, I will show you what the rules are here. Extreme phase. And then we'll look at the charts just so you can understand a little bit clearer. So extreme fade, we use Bollinger Bands, we use ADF, we use 15-minute charts. So we want to look for the currency pair. To watch the currency pair close at or above the third standard deviation Bollinger Band. And that's shows you it closing at or above the standard deviation Bollinger Band. And then you wait for the pair to move from the third standard deviation Bollinger Band to the second standard deviation Bollinger Band. And we want to close below, which is this candle over here. Then you only check to see and you take the trade if um, ADX is less than 25. Because the reason for that is because we want, because, you know, the rally that's happening here is very strong. But so, you know, it could be caused by a piece of economic data. It could be caused by a really significant news. So what we want to do is we want to wait for the currency pair to basically um, show us or tell us that the um, – tell us that the um, – show the trend is not that strong. And so that's why we want to see ADX below 25. That – it's coming from an uptrend. We want to sell at the open of the next candle. So we short here, stop, swing high or swing low, usually about 15 to 20 pips. And then um, your target would be one times risk or, and trail to stop or two times risk. So back to our live chart. Okay. So right now we, ha we saw this one earlier today. Um, and we see the ADX is below 25. And so you would have gone long once it closed above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band, which it did here. Um, and, that, and then it continued to sell off, so it was not a good trade. But because your swing, your entry would have been pretty much, I would say, at 125.42. And your stop would have been at, this time the swing low is here, 125.32. I mean, you had less than a um, 10 pip loss. Here, um, it closed at above the Bollinger Band, but we've not taken this trade because ADX is greater than 25. This one, you know, ADX is pretty much hovering around 25. Um, so maybe you would have taken trades, maybe you would have haven't. But let's look at some, you know, actual trades that we would have taken. So here's a, a good example of a trade you would have taken. It would have closed at or above third standard deviation Bollinger Band, you would have gone short here. This one yesterday would have stopped out. Um, okay, so finally some trades we would have taken here. This one, it closed at or below the Bollinger Band. We don't take the trade until the currency pair closes above the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. And then you check that ADX is below 25, and then targeting the Bollinger Band on the other side, either one times risk um, and trail or two times um, risk for two to one risk reward. This one, you also would have not taken this trade, so the ADF helps us to save us.
from um, from very trending moves and uh, I guess bad signals because it's above 25. This is a trade you would have taken. It closed below the first third standard deviation Bollinger Band. You wait for it to turn out. You would have gone long here and you know basically had about a 40, 50 pip move. Let's look for more trades. Here, you wouldn't have taken this trade. It doesn't set up all the time, but when it does, it can be quite significant. Let's see, let's just look for one more example of the trade. So here's another example, closed at or above the Bollinger Band. Um, this place ADX probably would have been above 25. Let's see if we can get some better setup. So here's an example, close at or above the Bollinger Band, you would have sold here for a small move. Here's another one that closed at or below the Bollinger Band and it took a little while, ADX was below 25 and they had more significant turns. This is another example of it. So that's how the extreme fade would work. So the last thing that I want to show you is back on at the daily chart. And um, if you bear with me one second, I'm going to change this to back to the to the um, first standard deviation Bollinger Band. We'll get rid of the ADX. You just uh, if how to remove the middle line. Um, sometimes most of the time packages, it's just a check mark, so you can just check it, and um, you can remove it that way. So the last way to use um, the Bollinger Bands is to help you identify points to get into the move at value. So let's say we're in a prolonged downtrend here. So one of the greatest fears that people have is selling into the low or buying into the top. So what um, I would be able to do is wait for the currency pair to retrace to the first standard deviation Bollinger Band. And that provides a point of value for us to enter into the trade in the direction of the trend. Um, and and um, in that case, you know, we could do that and then um, try to capitalize on the continuation move. So this would be a point to enter in value. You know, you could have left your, your order overnight to enter at this point at value. Um, in an uptrend, every single time it touches the first standard deviation Bollinger Band would be points to enter at value. Your stop is probably somewhere in the middle line. Um, you know, these, let's see how it would look on the pound dollar because we haven't looked at that pair in a while. Pound dollar also in a pretty significant downtrend right now. Um, let me refresh my chart. So points to enter at value, this would have been a point to enter at value. This one would be a point to enter value would have been stopped out there. Um, but like here, you have multiple points to enter at value, which is this point here, this point here, this point here, and this point here. And even this, you get this point, this point, this point are all points to enter in at value. So that's um, the different ways um, that I like to use a Bollinger Bands, and I show them often because they are truly battle tested, and I use them um, pretty um, aggressively. And the last thing I want to leave you with, um, if you'll bear with me, um, is just a little information on what we do at BK Forex Advisors. At BK Forex, we trade on um, both short and swing trading signals. Um, we basically, including in your included in the membership, we provide you with one to two intraday um, trading signals um, each day. One to two swing trades per week, as well as 8 to 12 um, ideas um, on economic data trade, news trade, um, a week as well. So all of these are included in your, in your subscription to BK Forex Advisors. So let's get down to business. To trade effectively, it means to have a trading plan, and a trading plan should be approached like a business plan. If you don't write it down, you won't do it. So every single um, trade that you take um, should include the reason for your trade, what you will be trading, and what type of risk control you will use. 
At BK, we provide you with all of these information on every single trade we take, how will we trade, what will we trade, and what risk control we will use, along with updates along the way. We've got a private Twitter feed for our clients that updates them on all the trades. That's one way we communicate with our subscribers. We also um, have a website where all this information is featured, and we also send you, um, we send you information, you know, via SMS or text message to your cell phone, as well as email on our website, Twitter, and um, also in a chat room on our uh, member section of website. And we have a $59 one-week trial that we're offering these days, so I encourage you to go to bkforexadvisor.com to, um, to get more information. So with that, I'm going to open up the floor to questions. I know I see some coming in. Um, from Len, on MT4, put a simple MA over the Bollinger Band to provide the same color as the background. Um, I think he's, in, he's asking, you know, um, he's helping JP answer his question, which I appreciate. Um, on the one hour, do you use three and two or one and two? On the one hour aroma, I use one and two standard deviations, not three and two, because it's a little bit too long a term. Any other questions? <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so if you don't have any questions, you can always contact me um, by clicking on the Contact Us button at BK Forex Advisors. Four hours, um, we're still using the, the two and the one because it's only when we go really short term that we go to the three and the one boy game. The spike for your Swiss last Thursday was caused by a whole bunch of reasons, um, but it was an intervention. There was some speculation that there's going to be a Swiss uh, tax law um, implemented on Greek deposits, and that would have led to quite a bit of a, a you know, flow in Euro Swiss, or flow into the Euro, into the Euro which, uh, because if they had to pass that tax revenue over to Greece, that would involve selling francs and buying euros, also just kind of some, you know, general market flows. So, once again, I thank you all for um, joining me today on this Memorial Day Monday. I'm going to go and enjoy my holiday um, and having a barbecue. And then just last question, which pair works best with this strategy? Um, I use this on all the majors. I'm selling from bands once in the downtime. How is this different from buying when it closes above the band? Uh, it's a different tactic. The one is joining the trend. And the other one is picking top and bottom. So I'm just illustrating the different ways that you can use the bowl in Japan. So have a great day and um, you know enjoy the nice weather. Thank you.